Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you very much for joining me today at the Buying a Home in the Netherlands webinar. Thank you for taking some time out of your day. Uh, maybe some of you are having an early lunch or a late breakfast, um, and the sun is shining. So it's, uh, it's always nice that you went inside to um, join us today. Before we get started, good to know that today's session will be uh, recorded and shared with you guys tomorrow, most likely tomorrow, and uh, not just the PowerPoint slides, but also the recording. So if you have to leave at any time, um, no worries, we'll send everything tomorrow so you can rewatch everything as well. Um, let's get started. First of all, I would love to introduce myself. My name is Ludo, I'm an expat buying manager. Uh, at Expert Housing Network. I am primarily focused on the Amsterdam area, um, greater Amsterdam, so to say, so also Almere, Haarlem, Zandam, um, Amstelveen, everything that is in the proximity of, of Amsterdam, so to say. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, but I've lived in the US for a couple of years um, as an expat child, actually, with my, with my parents, um, but decided to move back to the Netherlands as it's... Uh, most beautiful country, of course. I'm a proud father, not of children, not yet. I'm a proud father of two cats. If you guys are lucky, they might uh, jump on and show themselves uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> I live in a new built property in Amsterdam. Uh, used to live in a very old, old uh, part of Amsterdam, very old building as well, but then decided to, to purchase my own property and now am living in a new build, which has its perks as well, especially now um, with the gas prices being so high. I live in a gas-free property, which um, well, it saves me a bit of money at the end of the month, for sure. Um, I don't work at Expert Housing Network by myself. We believe that greatness is achieved in the agency of others. What do I mean with that? We have a wonderful buying team uh, at EHN. Um, people from all over. We have Giovanna and Rafaela, who are originally from Brazil. Both speak a bunch of, of languages. Um, then we have Ellen, originally from the Netherlands, but has lived the majority of her life in Thailand um, and in Japan, actually. Um, and well, speaks English and Dutch, but... I can tell you that she also speaks a, a quite a bit of Thai and Japanese, actually. Um, and then we have Rick. Rick is with us here today as well. Um, he's been uh, living in Colombia and South Africa, uh, but um, masters the language of Spanish as well. Rick is here today to um, help us with the Q&A. So if you guys have any questions during the webinar, feel free to pop them in the Q&A, and then he will be able to answer them live. If there are any questions at the end of the presentation that are not answered yet, we'll actually go over them uh, live as well. So feel free to do that. <clears throat> um, a little bit about uh, Expert Housing Network. So uh, good to know is that we aren't any uh, we aren't traditional real estate agents. The reason for that being is that we only help with uh, purchasing properties and renting properties. So we don't uh, sell and we don't let properties at EHN. Um, so our focus is really to secure a property for you, either on the buying side or on the rental side. We charge a fixed fee, um, so no percentages or anything like that. Um, it doesn't matter if you are buying at 500,000 or at uh, 1.5 million, you're going to be paying the same price. Um, we know what it's like to sell in a new country. Like you saw on the previous slide, uh, we've all either are expats or have had an expat experience. Um, so that's a, that's a big plus for sure. Um, the added value of Expert Housing Network, well, first of all, selling agents take offers from EHN definitely more seriously, as they know that we do our research well, we know what we're talking about, so if they get an offer from us that they know, okay, these guys are legit. Um, it's, it's definitely possible for us to, to book viewings when consumers are typically not able to do so anymore. A lot of selling agents has uh, dedicated days for viewings um, for people with buying agents. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that increases our chances of actually scheduling a viewing. Um, a big one is that we support by reviewing Dutch legal and property documents. Like uh, you saw before, Rick, um, Ellen and I and Giovanna actually well as well um, speak Dutch. So we're able to do that uh, and, and make sure that well, you understand what you're signing and what you're buying. Big one as well is we help define the market value through market data. In other words, we can help you um, know the market um, and know what kind of competitive offer you should be making and on the other hand also know what you would be able to get from a mortgage perspective um we help you uh, to inform about the rules and regulations again referring to dutch dutch law and a big one we make sure you don't make the same mistakes as we have made when purchasing our first homes 
I'm not here by myself today, not just with Rick as well, but we are here um, with our mortgage uh, colleagues. Cesar, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Ludo. Um, I'm a mortgage specialist. Um, I'm also the founder of Mr. Mortgage. Um, I founded the company in 2017 uh, after my career at uh, ABN AMRO. Um, the reason why I founded the company was, well, I, I, my parents came from Turkey uh, over 50 years ago. And even though they're smart people, they are entrepreneurial, their biggest asset has always been their network. So if they needed anything, they always went to their network to, uh, to solve whatever they were uh, facing. Um, and what I noticed with my clients when I was working at Abin Amro, especially the international clients, that they were facing the same issues and their biggest asset was always their network. Um, so the reason why I started this was actually my parents, but also the fact that I have a passion to assist uh, people that are coming from abroad and uh, yes, yeah, need, uh, need help and assistance. Um, uh, I'm not alone. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, I have a wonderful team. Um, uh, Agla is uh, our growth marketer. She's, uh, she started with us in 2020 and uh, she's doing an amazing job with, uh, with blogs, with uh, 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 even vlogs. So uh, she's, uh, she's a great assistant. Um, Robin uh, has been with us almost from the, from the start, 2017. Uh, he's the go-to guy. Uh, you'll uh, you'll be sure to. Uh, uh, I'll, I, I'm sure you'll love him when uh, when speaking to him. And then you have uh, uh, definitely uh, not least uh, but last Uskan, and um, yeah, we uh, we jokingly uh, call him uh, the Wizard of Oz because uh, he's uh, he's performing great work uh, towards banks uh, and also towards clients, always with a big smile. So uh, this is uh, this is the team. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cesar. Always great to have, uh, have Mr. Mortgage here as a partner. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, well, we introduced ourselves, but I think it's also nice to um, hear and see who we're actually talking to and who our audience is today. So I'm going to launch um, a little poll, obviously not obligated, but uh, always nice to see um, well, how you found us, uh, who you are, what um, uh, range you're looking at, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, potentially we can tailor the webinar a little bit towards the needs of the, of the group that we're talking to today. So I'll give you guys a, a few minutes. <clears throat> I see that the majority of the people are actually in the age range of 25 to 34. We'll share a little bit later why that is actually quite beneficial. Nice mix of singles, couples and families. And this is always a, a nice one. The question, what made you decide to buy? I always like to see that the majority say that they would like to settle. That's a big compliment to the Netherlands. Um, but the fact that the rents are too high is definitely a big one. So. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Let's move forward. So, um, well, today's goal is obviously to add value to you. We definitely believe in sharing information freely. Um, so if there are any questions also, yeah, we won't withhold any information or anything like that. We're an open book to, for, for sure. Um, some things that are good to know, I'm going to pass it right back to Cesar. Um, we'll start off with the NHG. Would you like to share something about that, Cesar? Uh, yeah, so uh, what is National Mortgage Guarantee or what is NHG? Um, uh, NHG is uh, an institute uh, backed by the government. Um, and their focus is to uh, assist first-time home buyers towards banks. How they do that is um, by taking away uh, the risks that a bank uh, can have, such as uh, if you get unemployed, uh, you still need to pay the mortgage. But if you can't and you need to sell your home and there is a a uh, debt because, for example, you bought your home for 350 a couple of years ago, and uh, let's say the market uh, has dropped and you can only sell it for uh, 300k. Um, in the meanwhile, you've repaid uh, your debt, obviously. However, 
it can be that you still have a remaining debt of 20k and then national mortgage guarantee uh, jumps in so uh, you don't have uh, any debt when selling the home uh, because you cannot pay for it anymore um, they have uh, a couple of requirements one of them is uh, the uh, maximum uh, purchase price uh, that used to be 355k but from the 1st of january 2023 this number is going up so if you buy a home up to 405k you can make use of the national mortgage guarantee scheme so that gives you a, a huge benefit uh, because you'll be protected. Another big uh, benefit is obviously, uh, and this is uh, uh, from a bank's perspective, um, because their risk is lower, you'll get a discount on the interest rate that a bank offers. So this is a huge benefit. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So my advice is always, if you are buying underneath the, the NHG uh, threshold, then definitely check in with your mortgage advisor to see if it is possible to actually get the NHG. It can be quite uh, quite nice to have the extra insurance. Cool, then um, uh, transfer tax. <clears throat> so um, you guys might've heard about it already. Transfer tax, what it is, it's, it's the tax that you're paying when ownership of a property is transferred from one person to another person, from a seller to a buyer. Um, typically the transfer tax is 2% over the purchase price. Um, that is the, the, the residential rate, so to say. Um, and this is the case for, let's say, all the properties that you're buying. However, currently there is quite a nice scheme uh, in play, and that is um, at least up to the end of 2024, where uh, in some cases you are exempt from paying transfer tax. There are a few requirements that you have to meet. Do you want to make use of this exemption? Um, but um, let's start off with the first one. First of all, you have to buy under um, 440,000 euros. It's mentioned here still as 400 because that was actually the case for 2022. But next year, the government decided to up that limit a little bit to 440. Um, so uh, for next year, if you're buying for 440 or lower, then um, yeah, you might be able to make use of the transfer tax exemption. A few other things are, first of all, that you have to be under 35 years old. So you have to be, let's say, a starter, be under 35 years old. And you can only use this exemption at one time. So if you've already used this exemption in the past, then you are unable to use it again. So three things, buying under 440,000 euros, under 35 years old, and using the exemption for the first time. If that's the case, then you're actually paying 0% transfer tax. In other words, what you see on the left uh, example. Um, on the right example, we have a couple both aged over 35. Um, then they're paying 2% over their share. Even if the property price would be you know, 300, if they're over 35 years old, then again, immediately you cannot use this exemption. Now we have a funny rate as well, and that's actually the exemption that you, or the uh, example that you see in the middle. Here we have a couple. So both people are buying 50% of the, the property, um, where Kate is 37 and John is 33. They're buying a property of 400,000 euros. Now in this case, Kate is not exempt for her uh, transfer tax because she is over 35 years old. So she pays 2% on her property share, but John actually is under 35 years old, has not used the exemption before, and he's uh, paying um, less than 440,000 euros. Then he is pay paying 0% over his property share. So um, in this case, they're not paying 2%, they're not paying 0%, but collectively are paying 1% of the purchase price as a transfer tax. Um, so that, that is a little bit transfer tax explained. On the right bottom, we have a button uh, when you get the record or the, the slides tomorrow, you can press on it and actually fill in your specific details and see how much transfer tax you're paying. Um, if you are buying primarily as an investment, won't spend too much time on this, but if you're buying primarily as an investment and not using as a residence, then you're paying 10.4% um, as transfer tax. So that is quite a, quite a high amount. Um, cool. <clears throat> Let's see. We'll move back, not to you, Cesar, not to you, Rick, not to me, but back to the audience. I'm uh, curious where you guys actually are in the buying process. So, again, I'll give you a, a few minutes to fill in uh, the poll. It's just three questions. Um, I think the first one is, is, is going to be a um, question that's going to be answered a lot in the researching uh, phase. 
Um, I've had a few cases where we actually had people in the webinar that already had an offer accepted. Fantastic. Then you are definitely far in the process. And that's always cool. But I think it makes sense that the majority is, uh, is in the research phase. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So renting versus buying it might be a little bit strange that we're going to touch base on renting as well, but I think it's important to, to for you guys to know what the, the pros and cons are from a, a, both renting and buying. We'll start off why it can be beneficial to actually rent a property. Well, first of all, um, and I think this is one of the biggest factors, is that renting your home gives you a lot of flexibility. What I mean with that is that um, if you are renting a property, then um, yeah, nine out of 10 times, you only have one month's notice period, meaning that if you get a phone call from your boss saying, well, look, John, um, we want you on the other side of the world in two months, then you just call up your landlord and say, dude, I need to be gone in two months. And then that's fine. You pay your two months and no strings attached. <clears throat> Besides that, um, there are little to no taxes, plus pretty much no maintenance as well. Why do I say little to no? Because as a tenant, you do have the tax of, uh, well, the garbage tax. But besides that, the, the real estate tax or property tax, the water tax, the sewage tax, that is all for the homeowner, or in other words, the landlord, plus big maintenance like the roof, paint work, uh, big uh, appliances in your property, that is all for the homeowner. Um, plus, renting a property to start off with is quite cheap because there are, besides the deposit that you're paying, obviously, um, there's no down payment. So there's no closing fees. You don't have to go to the notary. You don't have to pay for any um, transfer deeds, no um, real estate agent, no um, mortgage advisors, no banks, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas um, when you're buying a home, there are a little bit more costs uh, involved. Well, the uh, cons then of owning a home, they correlate a little bit with the things that I just mentioned. You're going to be paying taxes. The um, maintenance is going to be much more expensive and it's more difficult to move because you're well owner of the property and therefore kind of stuck to the property up until the moment that you sell your house. But we hope you guys are, are still interested in buying a home because there are definitely a lot of uh, pros to actually owning a home as well. First of all, stability. Um, stability in the sense of you don't have to move unless you want to move or of course if you stop paying your mortgage installments then a bank will come up to you as well and say hey <laughs> you kind of have to move but as long as you keep paying your mortgage installments there is no one that will actually kick you out of the property so if there is a, a crisis or um the the for example the rents are rising rapidly yeah, that doesn't affect you because you will just keep paying your mortgage installments and you can stay into the property for as long as you'd like. Um, mortgage installments are actually built up in, uh, in two things. You are building up equity and you're paying interest, whereas rent, you can compare it directly to interest in the sense that it's money down the drain, so to say. Um, when paying back on your mortgage, you are building up equity every month, and that is money that you can put into the bricks and uh, well, saving up money, so to say. Um, currently, there's also a nice mortgage interest deduction scheme, meaning that at the end of the year, when you're doing your income taxes, you can actually subtract a part of the uh, mortgage interest that you've paid. Um, so that uh, makes money even more cheaper tomorrow. Now, there are some cons of renting a property as well. First of all, the thing that I mentioned before, the expected expectancy is that the rents will keep on rising. Um, and well, because of that, it's it's going to be more and more expensive to have a, a flexible housing. Um, there are no tax benefits for renting a property. So, um, for example, the um, tax over garbage, yeah, you're paying that and it's not like you're getting anything back. Um, plus, it's also not that you're getting anything back at the end of the year over the rent that you have paid. Um, and again, there's no creation of wealth. Money is down the drain or in other words, you're paying off the mortgage of your landlord. Um, <clears throat> maybe from a financial perspective, Cesar, the difference between uh, renting versus buying. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Ludo. Um, it, what you see in front of you on the left side, you see a property, um, uh, two, you see two, two properties, um, uh, 80 square meter, um, uh, renting 
uh, I don't see the prices over here, uh, Ludo. Uh, I don't know if you could uh, help me out. Yeah, I think it's on the on the next slide. I'm sorry, it's two and a half thousand euros. Ah, okay, thanks, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so um, com comparing this, if if you would buy this property with an interest rate uh, of four uh, percent, with a mortgage duration of thirty years, the monthly payments will be somewhere around uh, two thousand three hundred and six euros. Um, the interest payment of the first month is uh, 1,650. I'm mentioning the first month uh, explicitly because uh, the more you pay down, which you're doing on a monthly basis, uh, the, the less goes uh, towards uh, paying interest. So your monthly payment stays the same, 2,363. Uh, the interest payment is 1,650. Uh, however, that will drop, so it means that the longer uh, uh, you have the mortgage, the faster you are paying down. Um, uh, looking at the purchase cost, uh, so the, the the closing fees in total, you're looking at um, a number of uh, uh, let's say nineteen thousand. Um, if you would compare that to renting uh, and the cost of renting, then you're already hitting a break-even point in twenty-two months. So this means in 22 months, you've already earned back the uh, closing fees of 19,000 euros. Just to give you, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, another benefit that uh, Ludo discussed uh, earlier. Um, um, so you're you're creating uh, uh, equity because you're you're paying down. Um, um, so what that means. Uh, so you can already see at the top total of monthly payments in five years. Uh, if you if you buy it, uh, then you're paying a number slightly over 140k. Uh, if you rent uh, this, the, a similar place, you're you're paying 180,000 in five years time. Um, besides this benefit um, and tax benefits haven't been uh, included uh, in this overview. Uh, but besides this uh, benefit, you also have the fact that you've been paying down for five years. Uh, so when you would sell the property against the same price, nobody can predict what uh, properties will do in the future, what property price will do in the future. So um, it's easier to compare uh, the, 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 the price you bought a property for and also assume you're, you'll sell it for the same price in five years, then because you've paid down uh, 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 on your mortgage, you will also get 49K in your pocket. So on both sides, you have the benefit of buying versus renting. Exactly, cool. Yeah, so to, if you're staying longer than 22 months, I would say it already makes sense to, to purchase a home, depending a little bit on the property you're working with. Um, but uh, it's quite nice to put some money in your own pocket if you're going to stay here anyway for a bit. Um, cool. So market drivers. So as we all know, the prices have been rising over the last couple of years. Um, the last couple of months, it's been stabilizing a bit, depending a little bit on where you're looking. Um, if it's Amsterdam or a small village um, close to the east of Amsterdam, the, the markets differ a little bit. But in general, the prices have been increasing. A few reasons for the for the prices um, increasing are, first of all, some fiscal benefits. There's a tax exemption, the transfer tax exemption, making it um, more favorable to buy and therefore more people to actually look, uh, more people therefore looking there for a home. Um, the interest rebate, in other words, making it cheaper to, to borrow money. Um, and there's no capital gains in the Netherlands. So if you sell your property with a nice profit, you can put the profit right into your pocket or into a next property that you're buying. You do not have to pay any taxes over that. Um, currently, there's still a tax-free parent donation. Well, it's, in the Netherlands, it's called a free parent donation, but it's actually a family member donation um, that is now 100,000 euros tax-free if you are going to be using it to purchase a property. Next year, it will hover around 30,000, and starting from 2024, it's actually gone. Um, good to mention though is that this is if your parents are Dutch or your family members are Dutch. If you live abroad, and you have a wealthy family member that would like to support you in purchasing a property, there is no cap on how much money they can transfer here tax-free. So um, it can be more than 100,000 euros then as well. Um, so 
yeah, might be something to look into if you do have those kinds of family members. Um, the interest rates, they are still on the lower side. Of course, there has been a huge discussion or not per se discussion, but huge talks about the interest rates rising from 1.5% to four and a half or so. Um, yeah, obviously that's a big increase, but 1.5%, correct me if I'm wrong, Cesar, but it was not a sustainable rate um, either. So I think the, the four and a half that we're looking at right now, um, I think it's stabilizing a little bit and is more of a, yeah, a normal normal interest rate if you compare it to other countries or if you compare it to 15 years ago 20 years ago then we're still on the lower side um <clears throat> can i uh, jump in uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. um no you, uh, you're right the only thing uh, that we expect to happen obviously nobody can perceive what will happen in the future um uh, however 2022 was a bit of a let's say uh, I don't want to say it's a crisis year maybe it is but it's also a uh, it's also seen as a transition period uh, indeed the 1.5 wasn't healthy um, I think um, uh, and uh, banks have uh, jumped a bit too high when it comes to the uh, interest rate hikes um, and the expectation is actually that, uh, so now we're looking at uh, 4.3, 4.4, uh, and the uh, last six weeks, uh, we've seen slow, a slow uh, decline of, let's say, 0 0.02 per week, 0 0.03. So we already see that banks are uh, dropping their rates a bit. Um, uh, and the expectation is actually that as long as there are no new uh, developments in the world, that the interest rates will could uh, decline a bit further, even to four, three point seventy five in the next couple of months. Yeah, interesting. Let's uh, let's see what happens. Curious for sure. Um, okay, moving on. Well, like I mentioned before, the the rents are on the high side. Um, and the expectancy is that this will keep rising. In other words, it's yeah, more makes more sense to purchase the property, especially with the example that uh, that Cesar gave before. Um, <clears throat> and this is you know driving up the demand. That's that's the last point as well. The lack of supply. Supply. There's more demand currently than there are properties on the market, and that's a well, basic school example. There are more people looking for a product um, than the amount of products available. Prices are going to go up with that product. It's exactly the same um, in, um, in, in the real estate world. Um, <clears throat> what you would need in savings. So as mentioned before, buying a house costs money as well. Not just the purchase price, but the whole process into purchasing a house uh, will cost you money. Um, a few things that, uh, that might come up in your, your search to a property. First of all, we have the transfer tax. The two percent of the purchase price um as mentioned before there are some exemptions but generally you will be paying two percent of the purchase price um then you'll need to go to the notary you'll need to go to the notary for two things a mortgage deed and a transfer deed if you're looking to buy in amsterdam you'll also go to the notary for the purchase agreement so there might be an additional cost there outside of amsterdam uh, the purchase agreements are drafted up by the selling agents the prices of these two deeds at uh, generally are between 600 to 1100 euros now if you are not buying a property with a mortgage but paying it completely out of own pocket then a mortgage deed is obviously not needed um a bank or a mortgage advisor typically charge between 1500 to 3400 euros typical real estate agent between one to two percent of the purchase price again ehn fix uh, charges a fixed fee um, an appraiser, someone who comes in to actually uh, give a value to the property and send that report to the bank, the appraiser charges between 700 to 900. Technical inspector around 440, not something that is obliga obligated, but um, if you're buying an older property, again, in the Amsterdam area might be smart to do, then a technical inspection is, is advised. Um, if you do not master the Dutch language, then a interpreter, a sworn interpreter is actually uh, obligated to be present at the notary uh, because funny enough when signing the transfer deed and the mortgage deeds the notary has to do this whole process in dutch otherwise the process is not seen as legal so you'll need to have a translator or an interpreter there to translate everything um, while we sign everything 
Um, now, if you're going for a bank guarantee, and we'll touch base on this a little bit later as well, you know, why you would potentially need a bank guarantee. Uh, but if you do choose a bank guarantee, then the costs for that are around 250 euros or 1% of the guaranteed amount. And if you are lucky enough to be working with the NHG, uh, they will charge you a one-time fee to you know, get access to the better rates and to the better uh, insurance, I'd say. And that is 0.6% of the mortgage amount. Now we have a third column uh, completely on the right with the question if it's tax deductible or not. Uh, what you see that everything that is related to money or related to uh, the mortgage is tax deductible. So the mortgage deeds, the bank or advice of the mortgage uh, advisor, the appraiser and the NHG. The technical inspection is also um, tax deductible if the bank um, requires you to have a technical inspection. If they don't require it, but you just want to do it for your own uh, peace of mind, then it's not tax deductible. Um, some tips to win in the current market. Well, first of all, and this is a very important one, that is the value, value, value. We really have to focus on the value. Now, let's work from, a, um, from an example. We have a property here, um, a very nice starter's property. It's valued at 395,000, or the asking price, sorry, is 395,000 euros. Um, however, after doing our research um, at EHN, we see, okay, the, the asking price is 395, but actually the market value, the value that you would uh, be able to get, or the, the amount that you would be able to get from a mortgage perspective is 415. Now, knowing the market value, knowing that there's quite a high demand, we might need to add a little bit of uh, money out of our pockets to actually secure the property. So we end up making an offer of 435. This is in the end, we get the, the winning offer. So this is the purchase price. Now, what you see a lot and what you hear a lot is the difference between asking price and purchase price as the overbidding, which yes, it is overbidding over asking price. Uh, but I prefer to look only at the overbidding over market value. In my eyes, that is the only real overbidding. And that is in this case in brackets, only 4.8% compared to the 10% that we see before. Um, why do I do this? Because in the Netherlands, there are no rules on um, for how much you have to list the property. So I know, for example, in Belgium, if the val value is 415, they can't go down 10% in asking price, uh, further down than 10% in asking price, or higher than 10% in, um, in, in asking price. Uh, but in the Netherlands, they can literally list it at 200 if they would like. Well, then that percentage would be much, much higher. So if we go to another example, we have the exact same property, different agent. They listed at 375. Market value is still 415, and purchase price is still 435. Yeah, then all of a sudden, the overbidding that we hear everywhere is 16%, but the actual overbidding is still, again, in brackets, only 4.8%. Still a lot of money, obviously, but it's definitely a bigger difference than the, than the 60,000 you mentioned before. So this is why it's very, very important to know what the market value is. A, to know what a competitive offer would look like, because if you know we added 20,000 euros over 375, we still wouldn't have made a shot. So that's why it's important to know what market value is and uh, to know what the bank will give you because uh, the bank will actually give you more than the asking price in this case they will give you 415 so um yeah again hammering on the uh, on value value and the second thing is a winning offer drafting up a, a winning offer means drafting up a good offer well what we mean with that doesn't per se have to always be the highest price but it has to be a good price and i'd like to refer back to the um example that we have here if the market value is 415 and we make an offer of 500 but we say to the sellers we also need a mortgage of 500 we're never going to get that because the bank is going to say well look the value is 415 i can't give you out a mortgage of 500 so um even though it's the highest offer it will most likely not get accepted because it's not a good price so to say um, that correlates a little bit with uh, with the second bullet point and that's offering security to the seller what we mean with that is we can put in the offer uh, how much money we need from a mortgage provider. So if we make an offer of 435 and we say we need a mortgage of 415, that will give security to the seller saying, well, A, we've done our research, we know what the value is, and B, we are actually able to add some own cash out of uh, pocket and therefore are not relying on a mortgage provider fully. 
Um, you can shift with this amount, uh, however you like. You can say, well, I do need a full mortgage. Then obviously there's not a lot of security to the seller, but a lot of security for us. Uh, but as it's a seller's market, uh, yeah, you still have to be a little bit careful with that. Um, you can also say, well, um, I make an offer of 435 and um, do not officially need a, a mortgage. Um, then you can say, well, it's not subject to financing or it's not um, subject to a specific amount uh, to get from a mortgage provider. Then you're still free to do so, even though you've mentioned it in the offer that you are not you know, relying on it. You are still able to apply for a mortgage. But um, if your mortgage gets rejected, rejected, then there is no insurance in the, uh, in the offer whatsoever. But it does offer quite some security to the seller, obviously. Um, then the third one, offering uh, the least amount of hassle. Um, yeah, this is something that it, it differs a little bit per um, area that you're looking in, in in the Netherlands. I know that in Amsterdam, it's very common, for example, to have a technical inspection in your offer. Um, it's not really seen as hassle, whereas um, in, in very new uh, municipalities with a lot of new built properties, yeah, there they don't really like the technical inspections because it just takes longer to actually sign the purchase agreement. So that would create a hassle there. But it's at least good to, to think about it. Um, and then the th uh, last one, offering a personal touch. What we mean with that is actually writing a little bit, little bio about yourself um, and actually attaching that to the offer. Um, writing that you love the property, the way that they have uh, designed it, um, how you are looking forward to start a family in that property or anything like that, just to um, show yeah, who you are and, and why you want to buy the property. This is especially um, important in um, homeowners associations where you're going to be sharing the building with a lot of other people and the owners nine out of 10 times want to make sure that the uh, property will be passed down to someone that will fit in, in the community, so to say. Um, and then the last one, <clears throat> and that, ooh, that is due diligence, there we go. So uh, due diligence, we, what we mean with that is the technical inspector and the appraiser. Technical inspector, obviously someone that is going to technically inspect the house, make sure that the house is in the states that we want it to be in and that there are no hidden surprises. And the appraiser, that is someone who is going to yeah, officially appraise or officially evaluate uh, the property and make sure that the bank knows what it's worth and that we know what it's worth. Now, before um, we move on, I do have a question for you guys. You can just pop it in the chat. Do you guys think um, these people are booked before or after your offer is accepted? I'll just give you uh, give you a few uh, seconds to fill us in. Do we book the appraiser and the technical inspector before or do we book them after the offer is accepted? I see some things coming in. some befores and some afters. Nice, well, I won't hold the tension any longer. <laughs> so um, the, the right time is actually right after the offer is accepted. Um, and, and, and yeah, the sweet spot would be right here. Why is that? It's because, well, first of all, in the Netherlands, um, you are not legally binded to the purchase up until the moment that you sign a purchase agreement. And typically between getting an offer accepted and signing the purchase agreement, we have around one and a half weeks. Um, so yeah, why make, uh, why spend all this money? Because that, that's the second part, the appraiser and the technical inspector, they don't work for free. And it's not um, a given that your offer will be accepted. So if you have to do two, three, four offers, and then you're paying two, three, four times for a technical inspector that might not even yeah, be value valuable because you're not buying the property. So that's why we do it right after the offer is accepted. Now, then we have one and a half weeks to do that, to get all the reports. Assuming that all the reports are up to our expectations, then we move ahead with signing of the purchase agreement. And from this moment is where you are actually yeah, legally binded to the purchase. And also the moment that together with Cesar or with one of his team members, you can apply for uh, the mortgage. Now we as a buyer, um, if we are a private person or private buyer, then we get a three day cooling off period. Um, and this is a reflection period where you, know, you can wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh my God, what did I do? You can still pull out, cancel the purchase without any financial consequences. 
Um, obviously not something that has the, the preference, but definitely possible. And uh, if anything pops up in the technical inspection report and we only get the technical inspection report here, then we still have time to do so. Uh, to get a little bit of a, a broader timeline of how the, the buying process is going to look like from A to C, um, we'll start on the left. Obviously, we'll have to start the search somewhere. Now, typically, um, you'll be looking on Funda to see what is newly listed. Um, good thing is that everything will be listed on Funda. So with your cup of coffee in the morning, see if anything meets your requirements um, and then uh, move on from there. You'll have the viewings here. Um, and uh, well, after the viewings, if you still are interested, you'll let me know if um, you want to move forward or not. That would be my cue to actually start with the uh, property document review or the yeah, reviewing the medical file of the property. And we'll do the price research so we know what the market value is. Then um, uh, together with you, we will come up with a competitive offer, an offer that makes sense in regards to the purchase of the property, but also makes financial sense from your side. Um, we'll be in contact with the selling agent and then uh, submit the offer on your behalf. And it's a few hours of, of sitting like this. Um, well, assuming that we do get good news, then uh, we'll move forward with the due diligence period. That's what we, we saw before. Um, this is where the appraiser and the technical inspector are booked. And if you're buying in uh, the Netherlands, or sorry, in Amsterdam, then you're also uh, booking the notary here. Um, we'll go to the notary. Uh, we'll go to the notary to sign the purchase agreement, but also to meet the sellers. Now, after we've uh, received the digital copy of the purchase agreement together with Ms. Mortgage, you can apply for the mortgage. So that's where this starts. You can do that uh, before the cooling off period ends. You can do that right away when you receive all the, the, the yeah, legal documents. Um, this process typically takes, yeah, I would say between two to six weeks. It's, it's quite a broad uh, timeline uh, because I know the guys at Mr. Mortgage are very quick and typically can do it between two weeks. Um, if you work directly with the bank, it, it generally takes a little bit longer. So let's say on average four weeks. <clears throat> um, we have another hooray moment here. That's when the mortgage application is approved because, well, in other words, nothing really can go wrong after that. You've secured your property, you've had your finances secured. So after this, it's just waiting until the sellers can actually transfer the property to you or when they are moving out of their property into their new house. Um, this happens here. Now, a week before that, uh, we'll receive the statement of completion. Now, it's, it's a fancy word of final invoice. It's an invoice that the notary sends with my costs, Mr. Mortgage costs, the transfer tax, the purchase price, municipal taxes, the notary costs, everything that you'll be paying, pretty much all the closing fees except the technical inspector and the appraiser will be all on one invoice. So you pay directly to the notary and then the notary distributes it accordingly. So that makes uh, makes your life a little bit easier. Um, then on the date of the, uh, the transfer, We'll have a final inspection just to make sure that the property is still in the same state as um, we have agreed upon. Um, if that's the case, then we'll go to the notary. We'll sign the transfer deed. That's where you get ownership of the property, and you'll sign a mortgage deed um, where the mortgage or the bank says, "Okay, we have the first pick um, if this um, buyer does not pay off his mortgage anymore." Um, and this is obviously also the moment that you get the keys of the property and time to party. You typically have around two months of a liability term. It is two months, but I always tell my clients to not take the full two months. Um, use the first two weeks to uh, intensively use your property, open all the windows, open all the radiators, um, open all the faucets, everything. Just make sure that everything works like it should, because in that first liability term, you can um, yeah, still contact the sellers and they are still somewhat liable for, for these kinds of things and actually can take over some costs as well. Cool. All right. Let's move over to the frequently asked questions. <clears throat> Rick, do you want to jump in and take the honors? So you're still on mute, uh, Rick. <laughs> yes, now you're working. All right. I said that uh, we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, and to start with, I think, for uh, Cesar. Shall we start off um, uh, with uh, the frequently asked questions on the screen? Oh, yeah, and if, uh, sure, sure. The Q&A will we'll pop, uh, pop up with those. Let's do that. Nice. Um, 
then still uh, a question for Cesar, I think, can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer? Yeah. Uh, in both cases, yes, you can. Uh, I, I'll start with the, uh, um, with the last one, uh, being a freelancer. Uh, what is important for a bank is the track record. So if you've just started, then it depends a bit on what you do. Uh, uh, if you can get uh, a mortgage already, uh, just to give you a, a, an example, um, and this is what we see a lot, um, we see uh, uh, software engineers um, that used to work for uh, uh, a big scale up. And then after a couple of years, they switch to doing the same, but as a freelancer, because they can earn more. Uh, in those types of scenarios, you already have a track record. And then you being a freelancer is, it just makes sense. Uh, uh, so then it could work uh, in a situation where you were always a, a, a software engineer. Uh, and then you, after a couple of years, you stop doing that and you start freelancing as a, a painter. Then in that scenario, you need to have a, a track record of at least 12 months because then the bank uh, feels more comfortable uh, uh, and uh, can already see if you can get enough clients and uh, what you're earning. Um, in the end, the bank wants to know what your earning capacity is. When it comes to a temporary contract, again, the bank wants to know what is your capacity uh, to, to, to earn. Um, then it depends a bit on your uh, situation. Um, if you already have a track record in the Netherlands of three years, then you can get a mortgage. If you have a temporary contract and your employer doesn't intend to uh, uh, extend your contract into a uh, indefinite contract, then you cannot get a mortgage. However, if they, if your employer has the intention to give you an indefinite contract after uh, the, the, the current one uh, expires, then you can get a mortgage. So I hope that uh, answers uh, this question. Thank you. I think, uh, I think it does. <clears throat> yes, I agree. Then the next question, what happens if you want to leave the country after several years? All right, I'll take, uh, I'll take that one. Um, in general, three scenarios. <clears throat> Um, first of all, uh, rather easy one, you keep your property, uh, but you also keep your mortgage costs. So you just keep off, uh, keep paying off your mortgage. Nothing really changes. Um, you're also responsible for any taxes uh, as a homeowner, but you just keep your property. You might want to use it as a um, holiday home or anything like that. Then the second one kind of correlates with the one that I mentioned before. You keep your home, but you actually also decide to rent out your property. Now, keep in mind is that you need permission from the bank um, to actually do this because you'll need to change your mortgage type from a residential mortgage to a buy-to-let mortgage. Um, there are some hooks and crannies about this. <clears throat> so definitely have a chat with your mortgage advisor at the moment that you do want to do this. Um, but that could be, uh, could be a possibility. And the third one, also a very easy one, sell your property without any penalty or capital gains taxes. Um, so really uh, not, not much um, exciting happens. Either you keep it, you sell it, or you keep it and you rent it out. Um, all, three, all three are possible. Um, to, and I think we'll, we'll touch base on this maybe a little bit later in another question, but just to come back to the, the second one, renting out your home. Um, in some municipalities in the Netherlands, if you want to rent out your property, um, you well, let me uh, phrase it differently. In some municipalities in the Netherlands, there is a self um, habitation obligation. Uh, and that means that if you're buying a property which has a WOZ value of a certain amount or lower, then you have to live in the property um, yourself and cannot use it as an investment property or as a, uh, a property to rent out, at least for a certain amount of years. So there is a, is a time frame for it. So for example, in Amsterdam, if you're buying a house that has a WOZ value, so that's not purchase price, not the appraised value, but it's a WZ value from the government. 
if that is 512,000 uh, euros or less, then uh, you have to use the property as your own residence for the first four years. After that, you can rent it out. So again, some hooks and crannies, have a look at it, uh, but typically everything, uh, everything is possible. Well, <laughs> the, the, the second question. <clears throat> yeah. Well, since you were uh, so clear, you can also answer this question. Can I uh, rent out a room, uh, my house or a room? Yeah, so, um, well, like I said before, it, it is possible. Uh, the one is a little bit easier than the other. So if you want to rent out your whole house, uh, you'll have to change your mortgage type from, again, from residential to, to buy to let. Um, uh, yeah, you'll need permission from the bank. You'll need to be able to do so from a um, municipal point of view. Um, but then, then it is possible. Um, if you want to rent out part of your house or let's say your room, um, it's a little bit easier. Technically speaking, the bank still wants to know, um, but they uh, majority of the time just want to know that you have a very good rental agreement with this person and also have an eviction clause in this, um, in the, in this contract that you have. So um, what do I mean with that? Because in the Netherlands, people get um, tenant, um, tenant protection very, very quickly. Like after they've lived in the property over a year, it's very difficult to actually kick them out. So let's say you take a roommate, you give him the room for two years and then you want to sell the property. If that roommate is going to be a little bit difficult, yeah, he can technically speaking say, nope, I leave her now. This is, uh, I still want to keep this property as, a, as my rental. Um, yeah, if you don't have an eviction clause, then you uh, literally can't evict him. So you want to have that in the contract. Is there anything you want to add on this subject, Cesar? Uh, no, you, uh, <laughs> you 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 described it uh, very well. It's uh, 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 always inform the bank either through us or directly. Um, banks don't have an issue with this, but they just want to have the paperwork done uh, so that if something happens, uh, they can uh, uh, they have the power to kick out uh, the difficult roommate. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Thanks. <clears throat> Then I think a question for you, Ludo, what is the 10% deposit I need to complete? Yeah, um, so uh, when you are entering into a purchase agreement, there are a few yeah, obligations that you have as a buyer. The seller also has obligations. One of the obligations as a buyer is to make a 10% deposit um, before actually getting ownership of the property. So typically, um, and I think we have a timeline here, yeah, 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 yeah. Typically, um, it, we stated in the offer that one week after the financing is arranged, so one week after the mortgage application has been approved, we, we make the deposit. Uh, why the deposit is needed is because, um, well, we as a buyer can go into this whole process, sign a purchase agreement, um, but then, yeah, there is no real incentive other than you know being able to buy a house, which is very, very nice. But besides that, there's no incentive to move forward with the process. So if for any reason we want to quit the process and move to Panama and leave our whole life behind, yeah, then, the, then there are no ties that uh, attach us to this contract or to the property. While the seller has taken the property off the market um, and, and is still left behind with the property, potentially cannot purchase the new house that they're wanting to purchase. Um, so there needs to be some kind of incentive for the buyer to move forward with the process. So that is why there's the obligation to make a 10% deposit that it's always 10% in the Netherlands. It doesn't differ uh, unless you make a very, very specific agreement, but otherwise it's always going to be 10% of the purchase price. It needs to be done um, one week after the mortgage application. You can do this in two ways, either by, well, just a deposit out of own pocket. So literally transferring 10% of the purchase price to the notary, they'll hold on to it for you. And then you can either use this for the purchase or you get it back and finance everything by a mortgage. Um, or you can use the bank guarantee. And that's something that we talked about before in the closing fees. Um, nobody expects you to have, you know, if you're buying 400K property, no one expects you to just have 40,000 euros on the bank. So you can always also ask the bank to make the deposit on your behalf. In other words, furnishing a written bank guarantee. Um, 
and that that states that the bank is responsible for the ten percent, so to say. Now, again, this is something that isn't uh, the banks don't, don't do everything anything for free, so they will either charge you two fifty or one percent of the, the guaranteed amount. But that is that is the ten percent that we're talking about. <clears throat> Yeah, then our fees. Um, I think that is a, <laughs> that's a, a nice one as well. Um, so we have uh, three three different packages uh, here at, at EHN. Uh, we have the smart package, the complete package, and a new build package. That's a, that's a new package that we offer. Um, how it works uh, with the complete package, it's, it's yeah, from A to Z. It's for the hard worker, for someone that is very new to the process as well, someone that is not familiar with uh, buying a property or with um, yeah, the Dutch systems in general. So how it works is you find a property and fund us something that you like, then immediately you'll send it to me. I'll book the viewing, we'll be, join you to the viewing, we'll be there to answer any questions that you might have, but more importantly, ask the right questions to the selling agents to really get a good idea of what we're looking at and what we're purchasing. Of course, I'll also be there to distinguish a cosmetic crack in the wall versus a structural crack in the wall, things like that. Um, we'll do all the research for you, so the property review, the price research, we'll submit the offer on your behalf, um, we'll be there to have contact with the selling agent, um, then we'll review all the documents that come out of the due diligence, the purchase agreement, um, the, the technical report and the appraisal report, um, then uh, of course we'll, by the way, be booking these third parties as well, we'll be uh, attending all the third party meetings, and then we'll be there for the full transfer support as well. And again, go to the notary, final inspection, all that stuff. Um, then we have the smart package. Uh, uh, we have specifically have a package for someone that is already um, uh, aware of how a process like this goes, potentially has bought a property already before, or just has the time to fully dive into the process. Um, this is where we don't schedule the viewings, don't join you to the viewings, and don't join you to any um, third party meetings. You'll see me a lot, but it will only be via um, yeah, Google Meets or Zoom. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit more of a, of a hands-off and for you a little bit more hands-on. Then we also have a new build package. Um, and uh, well, this is a little bit different just because um, yeah, we can't join you to a viewing because the property doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist yet. It's not there yet. Um, we also can't do a technical inspection of a property that is not there. So you get what I'm saying. So the process is a little bit different. We'll do search there as well. We'll attend any meetings with a developer or a selling agent. Um, we'll do a price benchmark. We'll go through the whole checklist and make sure that all the documents that are supposed to be there are actually there. We'll be in contact with the developers continuously and um, yeah, are there to, to hold your hand during that whole process. Unfortunately, our costs are not tax deductible, but the costs that you see here are um, yeah, but what you get, it, it won't be uh, any different than this. Uh, we ask a deposit payment, that's 499. The rest is only due completely at the end when we get you to the notary. As easy as that. <clears throat> Cesar, how about your packages? Uh, looking at our pricing, um, um, so most of our clients are first time buyers. Uh, or uh, are moving from their first apartment to a bigger home. Uh, and what you see over here is the, uh, the uh, fee of 2,999 euros. Um, there are some additions to it. If your case is a bit more uh, uh, at time uh, 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 extensive than, uh, than others. But for example, if you're an entrepreneur or a freelancer, we, we do charge additionally. Uh, but the base fee is always uh, 2,999. Um, we also have uh, uh, other services such as uh, uh, refinancing, uh, keep to let, buy to let, um, buying properties above a million. And that also uh, uh, causes banks to uh, give us extra work. Uh, so this is, uh, we, we also charge uh, additionally uh, for that. Um, um, and if you want to, uh, have more info, feel free to visit our website, mrmortgage.nl, or uh, just contact us and uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss this. Perfect. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, your costs are actually tax deductible, right? 
Uh, that is correct. So uh, for next year, you'll get back 37% of what you pay us. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yes. Looking forward to the moment where, where that will change for real estate agents as well. <laughs> Definitely. All right, cool. Before we move on to the Q&A, because I see we do have a few questions, so that is totally fine. We'll, we'll go over them live. But um, I'm going to launch our final poll, and that is just to see how you experienced uh, the, the webinar. It's always nice to see if we uh, can improve anything for like, next time or um, not if we're doing a good job already. So again, not obligated, but uh, would be highly appreciated. Okay, so I see some nice numbers popping in. That's always very nice to see. Thanks very much. It's like getting a report card. I'll send this to my parents later. <laughs> nice. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Let's move on to the uh, to the Q and A. All right, Rick, you are up. Moment to shine. Yes. So we do have a few questions left. Um, and to start with, for Cesar, if you have a company with external investors, um, and you have an employment contract from them, would this uh, be considered as an employee or as a as an entrepreneur according the mortgage requirements? Uh, it depends a bit on the bank. It depends a bit on how much of the shares do you have. Um, it depends on um, if you have uh, any say in what your salary is. Um, so it depends a bit on the situation, uh, uh, how, uh, how we can approach this. And it also really, it depends on the bank. Some will see you uh, as an entrepreneur. The others will see you as uh, being employed. All right, thank you. Um, then another question for you. Does owning a property in another European country influence uh, your taxes or mortgage or whatsoever? Uh, again, <laughs> it depends a bit on the situation. <laughs> um, what, is, what is good to know, what we do is uh, during our intake, uh, we want to know this information simply because we want to know uh, if and how much you are paying uh, for the mortgage that is connected to that property. If you're renting it out, we also want to see that. Um, looking at taxes, um, it depends a bit on if you have a 30% ruling or not. Um, um, so yeah, if, if you want to have more information, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, we can look into it. it it's, uh, yeah, this is a specific uh, question and uh, we would need to look into that, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, then let me see, Ludo, can you start the buying process from another country? Um, yeah, fair question, as the majority probably is uh, <laughs> our expats or, or currently staying in the, in a Europe or a different country. Um, yes, that is possible. Um, just keep in mind that uh, yeah, if you're going to start viewings, you, you can't view a property if you're not in the country, of course. Now, we can do video viewings, things like that, but it's I prefer not to purchase a property based on a video um, because, uh, I mean, renting a house is a little bit different, but when you're buying a house, and paying all that money uh, for a property based on a video. You, you don't see um, the, the neighborhood. Um, you don't hear the neighborhood noises. Um, you don't get a sense of if you feel at home there or not. So it is possible, um, especially like the start of it, just to um, do your research online and see which neighborhoods might be attractive and which wouldn't uh, see what you can get from a mortgage perspective, that kind of stuff. But I prefer to have our clients in the Netherlands and, and on the ground here in the um, area that you'd like to purchase a home because a, a viewing, a live physical viewing is actually important to see if you feel at home with the property and if it would be worth making an offer based on that. But technically speaking, you don't have to be in the Netherlands to, to purchase a home. All right, thank you. Um, Cesar, another question for you. Um, what if your mortgage gets rejected after you've signed the purchase agreement? Um, 
it depends a bit on what is in the purchase agreement. Um, we so we work with uh, almost thirty lenders. So when you when you work with us, the 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 chances of you getting a rejection on a mortgage is uh, yeah almost almost uh, zero. Uh, because if Bank A rejects it, we already know beforehand, and then we can contact uh, Bank num uh, Bank B or Bank Number Two. Um, um, if they reject it, it depends on the purchase agreement, uh, what is written over there. Uh, uh, but and maybe Ludo can uh, can tell uh, uh, a bit about that. Uh, if a mortgage gets re rejected, there is a financial clause uh, that you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that um, well, that's a built-in insurance so to say and that's what i was talking about if we're offering security to the seller or not we can put in the contract or put in the offer but it will automatically go in the contract that says um we want to purchase the house for five hundred thousand euros but this purchase is subject to the financing of four hundred thousand euros from a from a mortgage provider um there's also a time on it. So that clause is typically only valid for four or five weeks, meaning that we need four or we, we have a max of four or five weeks to get the financing uh, arranged from a mortgage provider. Um, but if we have that clause in there, so let's say with the example I said before, purchase price of 500, um, financial clause of 400, we apply for a mortgage of 400. And um, in some crazy, uh, for some crazy reason, you get that rejected then we can go to the sellers and say, well, look, I did my very best, but here there's a rejection from the bank. And then the contract is actually nullified because, um, well, we had that insurance based on this. Now, as you can imagine, um, yeah, the sellers, again, they prefer not to have these kinds of things in the offer because it, there's a, an extra possibility that the purchase might not go through. through. Um, but we can indeed, and especially now in the market where it's slowing down a little bit, we have more room to add these kinds of clauses into the contract that um, yeah, give give a buyer more security. I hope that answers the question. Perfect, thank you. Um, then a similar kind of question, is there also such a thing with a technical inspection? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, luckily, no. And why is that the case? Uh, I mean, I say no very quickly, but we can pretty much put everything in the offer that we want and we can put everything in the contract that we want as long as both parties agree to it. But um, <clears throat> if between getting the offer accepted and uh, signing the purchase agreement, that is when we have the technical inspection. So uh, typically we have the technical inspection report already before we officially enter into the contract because like I said, we only officially enter into the contract the moment that we sign the purchase agreement. And this is around one and a half weeks after getting the offer accepted. So if there is anything that comes out of the technical reports that is not up to our liking, all of a the sudden there's a huge amount of asbestos in the roof and the roof needs to be replaced and that's going to cost you 10,000 euros. Yeah, that might be a reason to say, well, never mind, we'll move to another property. Um, yeah, then we can say, well, guys, look at the technical report and uh, we cancel the uh, cancel the purchase, not the purchase agreement, because there is no purchase agreement yet. So we just cancel that the offer is accepted, so to say. Now, in some cases, um, so for example, during Christmas now, um, sellers quickly want to have the signature on the purchase agreement, but all the technical inspectors are on vacation and they say, well, you go first, first week of January, you're the first, but next week, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Then we have to be a little bit more creative. We can say we put in the uh, purchase agreement, there's going to be a technical inspection. And if there are any things that uh, need to be uh, replaced or fixed or maintained, that is over, let's say 2000 euros, then we can pull out of the contract. Um, but I would say nine out of 10 times, we already know what is in the technical report before we enter into the contract. All right, thank you. Um, Cesar, is a foreign income also considered when applying for a Dutch mortgage? Um, it depends a bit on where uh, where you get that in income from, uh, and also in which currency. Uh, but there are possibilities to uh, to use that, um, 
and we'll have to answer some questions, uh, obviously, because if you work abroad, uh, then um, what will you do in the Netherlands? How long will you live in the property? Those types of questions uh, and do we need, we need to answer? Because a bank wants to have a long-term relationship since you're getting a 30-year mortgage. Um, but there are definitely possibilities and uh, we can work you through those uh, in, a, in, a, in a more personal uh, call. All right, thank you. Um, Ludo, what are the steps of finding out about the market value? Is that something which is public information or do you need an agency to, to get this? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. And um, well, I, I said it in the beginning of the webinar, we're gonna share all the information freely here. So that's, that's what I'm gonna do again. Um, what we use is the same technique as the appraiser, and that is the comparable method, or in other words, um, comparing the property that we want to buy with properties that well, have comparable factors. So we're talking location, size, amount of bedrooms, amount of outside space, year it was built, ground lease situation, um, that all that kind of stuff that has impact on the value. We find properties that have you know, comparable factors like that. Then we look at the purchase price per square meter, the average purchase price, uh, the average purchase price per square meter of those properties and multiply it with the um, property that we want to buy and those square meters. Uh, that is said in, a, you know, in an easy way. Obviously there are a lot of factors that might have a little bit more impact on the value or a little bit less impact on the value. Um, so that is definitely where an agent comes into hand, but also, getting access to these purchase prices yes it is public information um, but it is not not user friendly at all um, and um, sometimes properties are sold let's say last week or two weeks ago um, then the purchase price is not uh, public information yet because it will only become public information from the moment that the transfer has been so um, yeah, working with an agent it makes it a lot more streamlined a lot more easy and a lot more reliable um, a lot more reliable way to get access to a market value. But it is it is possible. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that um, we work within a secret association that come up with market values because that's, that's not the case. All right, thank you. Um, then properties that are listed longer than a day ago, ago on Funda, are those worth looking uh, into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, a question I I still get a lot, but used to get much more, um, because if when we're talking like January, February of this year, it was crazy. Um, if a property was listed yesterday, then today the few weeks slots would be full. Luckily, um, and luckily from a buyer's perspective, the market is slowing down a bit, meaning that um, if a property has been listed for a week, nine out of ten times you can still get a viewing. So um, my advice is always pick up the phone and call the agent uh, because um, yeah, nine out of 10 times, then they're also willing to just put you in somewhere. Uh, but you can fill in the form on Funda, but then they just look at it at the end of the day and see, well, do we still have some slots available? And then they just pick some people that can um, uh, go to the viewing. If you pick up the phone and call the agent, then now, nowadays, um, yeah, pretty much always you can be you are able to get a few more. So yes, it does make sense to to keep an eye on properties also that have been listed on Funda for longer than a day. Thank you. I see quite some personal questions. Then I, I'd recommend to uh, schedule an intake with either EHN or uh, with Cesar. Um, maybe. Uh, Ludo, you can tell a little bit more about what you think the market will uh, look like for the coming years. And then mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do my best. I don't have a, have a glass ball. Um, for example, I also, if you asked me this question um, three years ago, yeah, I never thought that uh, that COVID would happen or that the, the interest rates would, uh, would go up all of a sudden, that kind of stuff. Um, so again, you never know what's, what's going to happen. Uh, but my what i expect to happen is that the market is going to cool down a little bit further next year 2024 as well and then starting from 2025 it will steadily increase again if we look at what the abian amro came up with was a number of six percent drop in the next two years so again not a huge drop that we're talking about 
um, but uh, at least it's stabilizing and going down a little bit. It depends also on uh, what kind of property you're looking at. Are you looking at an apartment uh, in the center of Amsterdam or are you looking at a castle somewhere in the far east, the middle of nowhere? Yeah, th those uh, properties behave different and those markets behave different. Um, what I expect if COVID is officially, officially over, um, <laughs> I too much remarks about that, but if it's officially, officially over and the, the war um, uh, with, with Russia and Ukraine is going to settle down a little bit, then the banks are also going to settle down a little bit, which um, yeah, will stabilize the market even more as well. I think starting from 2025, prices are going to steadily increase again as well. Hopefully not in the same manner that we've seen in the last two years, because let's be honest, that is not sustainable. Um, but um, yeah, I, I still see um, a purchase in, in bricks to be a, a smart way to invest your money. Um, and at the same way, or in the same way, also being able to use that investment as a whole. So that's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. All right, thank you. Then let me see. Um, says, are there any other companies like, except from the, the well-known banks that, that offer mortgages? Um, yeah, so obviously you have the three big banks, uh, Abinomro, Rabobank, uh, ING. Uh, as mentioned before, we work with almost 30 lenders. Um, uh, good to know these three banks also have uh, mortgage lenders, so they are selling mortgages not in their own name, but are investing uh, uh, through subsidiaries, for example. Uh, you also have the big insurance companies uh, that offer mortgages, um, uh, uh, lenders uh, uh, backed by uh, Dutch pension funds, um, other specific lenders. Uh, so the, the market is quite... Uh, 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 competitive in that sense so that there, we have a lot to offer uh, so uh, you don't have to go to your own bank uh, in that sense uh, you could get a mortgage over there obviously uh, and in some cases your own bank is the best uh, decision uh, or is the best lender uh, but then if you work with uh, with someone who's in independent like us um, you'll at least know that that is the best choice for you. Uh, and otherwise, we can look for a better option, obviously. So, Thank you. Um, let me see again. I see some personal questions. Uh, then one, one more question. Is having a life insurance obligated uh, part of the, the mortgage process? No, this used to be the case. Uh, but uh, it isn't anymore. However, when you work with us, we will always advise you. Um, um, we will not always advise you to get one, but uh, we will give you insight into uh, if we believe you need it. But in the end, you're the one deciding. Uh, just to give a small comparison, uh, maybe your personal trainer, if you have a personal trainer, uh, says that you see that that you should eat. I don't know. Maybe I don't. I'm not a, a, a specialist, but maybe eat less carbs. Uh, and but during the day, you still decide to uh, have a cake now and then because you enjoy cake. So uh, 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 even though somebody advises you to do something, you don't have to. But at least you'll know why, and we'll show you all the numbers, and we'll also show you uh, yeah, what happens if. For example, one of you passes away. Same goes for uh, unemployment. Uh, we will advise you uh, on uh, mitigating uh, unemployment. Uh, this can be either through, any, through insurance or through uh, your savings. Uh, you'll see the numbers, and then it's up to you to decide how you want to uh, proceed. Thank you. Um, then Ludo, another question for you uh, regarding the market value. So let's say the um, value of a property is two hundred, three hundred. Oh, the price is three fifty. You offer uh, three seventy, knowing that your max mortgage capacity is three eighty. Um, in this case, what uh, is the bank going to give you if the market value is three fifty? 
Um, well, so uh, if the if the house if the asking price is three fifty, and you offer three seventy, and the market value is also three fifty, so market value three fifty, but you bid three seventy, even though you are able to get three eighty uh, based on your income, etc., the bank will give you one hundred percent of the market value. So that is three fifty in this case. Um, now. If the market value was 370, they would give you 370. If the market value was 1 million and you were able to get 1 million based on your income, the bank would pretty much give you 1 million. But uh, in this specific uh, example, if the market value is 350, uh, purchase price is 370, then the bank will give you 350 and you will have to pay the 2000 euros difference out of own pocket. All right, thank you. Um, then another question for you, Ludo. Can EHN also support um, regarding the evaluation of the neighborhood or, or area? Yeah, of course, definitely. So that is uh, I think, uh, also a very big part of um, having a, a buying agent or real estate agent on your site. So we don't just advise on um, the specific property itself that you're looking at, but we will also consult in the neighborhoods that you potentially want to be buying. So. I can imagine, especially, of course, for expats, um, if you just moved here or if you've only lived in one side of Amsterdam or one side of the country, then it can be nice to have some advice on which neighborhoods are very family friendly or which neighborhoods you can better avoid, maybe. Which neighborhoods might be nice if you are a young person wanting to go to a bar every weekend. Um, so we, we can definitely help you with that and, and uh, send some figures um, about that as well. Um, so, yeah, no, of course. Definitely. Thank you. Um, then Cesar, is there a chance that you can get a higher mortgage than the calculator shows uh, online? <laughs> I, I really like this question. Uh, <laughs> the simple answer is yes. Um, calculators um, are, are just a teaser um, um, and they're meant uh, as a a lead generation, a lead generation tool. Uh, uh, so if you fill out a calculator, it will give you an estimate of uh, what you should be able to borrow more or less. Uh, but reality can be different. And yes, you can also, it can also mean that you can borrow more. And there are also techniques that uh, we can use uh, so you can borrow more. So it's, it's, it always makes sense to contact a, a real person instead of uh, just uh, using the uh, calculators online. But it does give you a good estimate. Thank you. Uh, then a, a personal question. Uh, I just started working. Can I still get a mortgage uh, if you started less than a year ago or should you have yeah, uh, a, a yearly track? Um, it depends a bit on, uh, if, if you dive into the matter, then it, it depends a bit on the type of contract you have. Um, the, the, what we always try to tell people is that buying a home has two sides to it. Uh, one is uh, financial. Uh, what are you capable of buying? But the other side is the uh, emotional side of buying. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, when I used to work at the bank, um, I was, um, uh, I went to the notary to, to sign all the paperwork, to receive the keys to my new home. And, uh, I, I was, I, I was young. So what I did, the meeting with the notary was in the morning. Then I went uh, back to the office in the afternoon because career is important. Um, and then, uh, all my colleagues congratulated me, not with my new home but with my uh, uh, long-term debt that I need to pay off until I would uh, retire. Um, um, uh, obviously that is a joke, but it does sh sh uh, show the difference between, yes, buying a home, uh, you have the emotional side of it, you love your new home, uh, but you also have the financial side of it. We'll always answer the financial questions, but if we notice that it's, not a good decision for you at this moment, then we'll also talk about that for a bit. Uh, so you're making the right decision. Thank you. Um, then what if you have to move to a different country? 
um, but you would like to keep the property as an investment, is there a different interest rate? Uh, yeah, and in such a scenario where you move to a new home, um, you can keep the property, um, and then indeed you have to deal with a different uh, type of interest rate. Uh, uh, how a bank works is the more risk they take on, uh, the, the higher their return should be. In other words, the interest rate. Uh, so if you want to rent out uh, your property, then you need to get a product, a mortgage product that uh, fits that situation. Uh, and yes, that also means that uh, the interest rate will be uh, calculated in a different way and will most likely be higher than what you're uh, paying. All right, then we have the final question, I think. Um, and it's also for you, Cesar. What are the conditions in case of unforeseen unemployment scenarios? Uh, it depends a bit. Um, if you still have savings and you, and you can pay the mortgage, then yeah, that's that's that. Um, you can always call uh, the bank to tell them that you lost your job, and then they can help you uh, to uh, to look for solutions. Just to give you an example, if you tell them that uh, you, you lost your job, but that you believe that within three months or within six months you'll be able to find a new job uh, and pay the mortgage again, then what they could do is give you, for example, a temporary discount uh, so that uh, you will have a solution for the time that uh, you need to find a new job. Uh, if that doesn't work out, because uh, uh, the bank will always think along, it's also in their best interest to help you out. If that all doesn't work out, then you can always sell the property and depending on NHG, yes or no, depending on uh, other insurances, um, uh, uh, you'll, you'll find a solution. Uh, and if not, then you can sell your home. That's the uh, most realistic scenario. So, uh, and I'm happy that we're going to, because this was a bit uh, of a sad note uh, ending with the unemployment. But I'm happy that uh, I'm seeing the slide right in front of me. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, indeed. Well, that, that was the last question. So um, we'll, we'll be um, sliding towards the end now. If there are any unanswered questions that might uh, pop up after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us. We'll send um, all the information that you saw today, tomorrow to you guys, um, together with the recording as well. Um, there'll be a link there to, to schedule a free intake with either me if you have questions about the buying process or uh, with Cesar if you have any mortgage related questions. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining today. Thank you very much Cesar for being our reliable, reliable partner when it comes to mortgages. Thank you Rick for uh, answering all the questions during the webinar and posting the Q&A. Um, and I wish you all a very, very nice holidays time and uh, New Year's. And then we hope to see you in the new year. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks very much. Have a good one. Enjoy the sun. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.